Uh, hello, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the world today. Uh, my name is Teresa Chen, and I'm part of the Skoll Foundation team. Um, I'm really excited to welcome you today to the Skoll World Forum session, Cultivating System Leaders for an Age of Pandemics. Um, our theme at the forum this year is Closing the Distance. Um, we thought there was no better way to reflect that uh, than to invite our global network to design and build a new kind of event together. Um, a few quick items before we begin. Uh, the session is being recorded and it will be released publicly after the event. Um, please use the chat to engage with each other and ask questions of our speakers. And uh, the session is scheduled to end in 60 minutes. Um, after the session, we invite you to take a few seconds to complete a single question feedback survey um, in the poll tab to the right of the screen. And um, if you're on social media, please use the hashtag SkullWF. Um, we're using that one and we'd love for you to do the same. Um, and uh, we're so thrilled to be able to include the, the session today in our virtual school world forum. Um, we want to extend a special thank you to the School Center for Social Entrepreneurship at the University of Oxford um, for proposing and designing it. And uh, with that, I'd like to introduce my friend, uh, my colleague, um, all around great guy, <laughs> Peter Durback, Director of the School Center for Social Entrepreneurship. Over to you, over to you Peter. Thank you, Teresa, and hello, everyone. Welcome to day two of the Virtual Skull World Forum, and thank you so much for being a part of this. In normal times, many of you would be with us here in, in Oxford, and we're gutted that we can't be together. It's a beautiful, sunny spring day here, um, but such are the times. Of course, the beauty of this virtual event is that so many more of us can be, um, can be together and be a part of this event, and so we're grateful to all of you, and particularly grateful, of course, to our friends at the Skull Foundation for um, curating this uh, extraordinary event and for allowing us to be a part of it. Um, as Teresa said, I'm Peter Drobak, Director of the School Center for Social Entrepreneurship. Um, we're based at the Said Business School um, uh, here at the University of Oxford. Um, and the School Center exists to advance social entrepreneurship as a force for good in the world. Like the School Foundation, we believe that social entrepreneurs are, at our core, system entrepreneurs. Uh, we tackle wicked problems by addressing their root causes, by using system thinking to unlock innovation, and by building collaborative coalitions for change. And so systems leadership is really one of our central concerns at the School Center. Through programs like Map the System, a global systems change competition um, with a network of over 60 universities around the world, we're working to cultivate a new generation of system leaders to tackle the world's most pressing problems. One of the oft repeated mantras that we've all heard during this pandemic is that none of us are safe until all of us are safe. But in this age of entanglement, that same mantra can be applied to the climate crisis, to the scourge of systemic racism and the worsening pandemic of inequality, to threats to democracy and our institutions of governance, and of course, to the next global health threat whenever that comes. We're living in an age of pandemics and the old rules of the game no longer apply. Now, the pandemic has put a fascinating, if disturbing, lens on leadership in the 21st century. If you look around the world at the countries that have responded well to COVID-19 and those that have struggled, the decisive variable is not GDP, not concentration of scientific expertise or hospital beds, it's leadership. Now, it's clear that the traditional model of top-down, square-jawed, hierarchical, command and control leadership is no longer fit for purpose in an interconnected, distributed world. Professor Peter Senge defines system leadership as someone able to bring forth collective leadership. And this echoes some of the insights we heard yesterday from President Sirleaf and President Zedillo in that brilliant opening plenary discussion with Lindsay Spindle. And that's where we're going to kick off from uh, today. You'll all be able to join the discussion in two ways. Um, first off, we'll be doing a couple of polls over the course of the hour on Slido, so please do have a mobile device handy so you can join into that. And then I want to encourage all of you to get a conversation going in the chat on the right-hand side of your um, hop-in platform, um, conversation with one another, and please do send in questions uh, for our brilliant speakers, and we'll try to get to some of those today as well. And with that, I'm pleased to introduce the four extraordinary system leaders who will be dropping some wisdom in this session. The list of their achievements could um, fill an hour each, so I'll try to keep the intros brief, um, but we will pop some bio links into the chat. Um, so going in alphabetical order, 
interestingly, these four speakers, you can go in alphabetic order by first name or last name, and it comes out the same. Uh, first is Dr. Agnes Binaguajo. Agnes is the Vice Chancellor of the University of Global Health Equity in Rwanda. She's a global health luminary who served for many years in the government of Rwanda, including five years as Minister of Health, where she was really the chief architect of what I believe is one of the world's most innovative health systems. Agnes went on to co-found with me and others, University of Global Health Equity, which aims to transform how healthcare is delivered around the world. Welcome, Agnes. Um, next up is uh, Dr. Cheryl Dorsey. Cheryl is the president of Echoing Green, a global nonprofit that supports uh, social, emerging social entrepreneurs and invests deeply in their ideas and their leadership. A social entrepreneur herself, Cheryl received an Echoing Green Fellowship in 1992 to launch the Family Van. Um, she served in two presidential administrations and currently serves on several boards, including the Bridge Van Group and the Skoll Foundation. Cheryl's also been an indispensable voice and leader uh, in, in recent years in advancing uh, racial equity. Uh, third is Professor Joe Sway. Joe is an ecosystem builder and a systems change guru with a PhD in system dynamics from MIT. He's founded and led a number of organizations that cultivate systemic impact, including the Academy for Systems Change, Umplexity, as well as the Systems Impact Multifamily Office, or SIMFO, where he's currently CEO. Joe's pioneered a method of participatory systems mapping, uh, and he teaches this at MIT and at the National University of Taiwan. And finally, Paul Pullman. Uh, Paul is the co-founder and chair at Imagine, a social venture accelerating business leadership to achieve the global goals. Uh, Paul's also the chair of the International Chamber of Commerce, the B Team, the Sai Business School, um, and also a vice chair at the UN Global Compact. In his decade at Unilever, Paul emerged as one of the world's iconic CEOs, putting sustainability at Unilever's core and setting an example that many firms have since followed. Please give all of our speakers a warm welcome. And before we kick off and turn to the four of you, um, we wanna just reach out to the audience first and kind of see how everyone's feeling today. And so we're gonna do a quick Slido poll. So if you look at your screen here, you can either take a, a camera out and use the QR code, or you can go to slido.com and just add, um, type in SCOLWF um, into the little hashtag um, uh, thing that will appear on the page. And that should open you straight up to our first quiz question. It's not a quiz, it's a poll. This will not be graded. So we're just giving you a moment uh, to get set up there. And uh, in a second, we will uh, put up the first question. Um, so given our experience with the COVID-19 pandemic, and I'm really thinking about this from the standpoint of kind of what we've seen in leadership, do you feel more or less confident about our ability to deal with future global threats, whether those are future pandemics, the climate crisis, uh, or any number of other things? One of the things I love about the school community is their optimism. It's good to see. So it looks like we're about two thirds saying more confident and one third saying less confident. We'd love to hear why um, in the chat and we'll certainly reflect on that with our speakers as well. Um, why don't we go on, they're still coming in, but why don't we go on to the next question since we got a flavor. So looking around the world, how effectively do you feel the following regions have been in responding to the COVID-19 crisis? Um, so the regions are Sub-Saharan Africa, Central Latin America, East Asia, the Pacific, Middle East and North Africa, Europe, North America, and South Asia. Ranking takes a bit more time, so we'll give you a minute. Um, we're seeing East Asia and the Pacific, which is unsurprising, of course, given what we've seen from Taiwan, from Singapore, from Vietnam, from China. 
And then after that, it's, uh, it's, it's fairly distributed. So we're seeing a little bit of each region and this will be really interesting to discuss. One of the things that's been really striking is if you would have, if we would have asked this question a year and a half ago before the pandemic, I think we would have been given a different set of answers. Something called the Global Health Security Index, which ranks the, um, uh, the, the preparation of each country around the world to respond to a global health security threat. And, and at the advent of 2020, the number one country on the Global Health Security Index was the United States. And we all know how that's gone since. Um, and, and so one of the things that I think has really emerged is that success stories have come from what may be to some unlikely places, including some of the regions in uh, in Asia that I mentioned, including places like Rwanda, which we'll get to. It's no accident that um, uh, we have the speakers here with us today that we do. Um, so thank you um, for filling this out. Please keep the conversation going in the chat. Uh, we're going to move on now and turn to our speakers. And I want to start with, with Paul and then Cheryl, and then we'll turn to um, we'll turn to Joe and Agnes to talk about the experience in their countries as well. But Paul, maybe to kick us off, could you offer some reflections on sort of lessons from leadership, good or bad, um, over the course of the last year, and and what we can take from this as we look ahead to um, you know the future threats that we all face. Well, Peter, thanks for the opportunity, and hello, everybody, and uh, certainly an honor to be part of this distinguished uh, panel. Um, if you look back at uh, COVID, I think there are some lessons in COVID that uh, clearly relate to leadership. But um, the positive things around COVID, I think, is that people now have understood the complexities of the world and the interrelationships between biodiversity, uh, human health, climate, the racial dimension, uh, the economy itself. And um, we have seen people step up. If there's any lesson in COVID, is that uh, certainly from the private sector, companies that have operated under a multi-stakeholder, longer term perspective, putting purpose at the core, uh, financial institutions that have put their money behind ESG investment, they seem to have done better. And one of the things that COVID has done without any doubt is not only exposed the weaknesses in our system and the tragedies, but I think you've also seen an incredible heroic effort, especially on the ground, uh, by many people and brought to light, in fact, some of the new and more successful uh, business skills or leadership skills that are needed. Uh, first and foremost, the high level of empathy that is needed and compassion uh, that is required in leadership. The S of ESG, as I call it, has come more to the foreground, the social dimension. And leaders that understand that, that act like human beings, and bring that uh, to life are doing better. You mentioned, Peter, some of the countries that have done better during the COVID crisis. And these are countries, frankly, that are all led by women broadly and have shown a higher level of empathy, but also have created an environment of a higher level of trust by frequent communication, by openness, by transmitting the truth and creating that level of confidence that is needed. Now, from a private sector and business point of view, uh, it's not easy to be a CEO in this environment. Some people said there are decades that nothing happens, and then there are weeks that decades happen. And I think what you're starting to see here is this enormous change at all levels and that complexity. The digital changes coming in, the uh, geopolitical changes we have to deal with, the environmental and social dimensions, and then obviously many, many challenges that companies face just to keep their heads above water in the economic pressures that they're facing. And it requires leaders, first and foremost, that, I, as I mentioned, are human beings, leaders that put the interest of others ahead of their own, leaders that are able and willing to take responsibility for these externalities out there, but above all, leaders that can look at this complexity, boil it down to simplicity and simple actions, and are able to move their businesses forward in the right direction as a result of these um, these uh, discontinuities. Thank you, Paul. Um, I, I, it's rare that uh, when you ask somebody about the characteristics of leadership, the first thing that comes up is compassion. Uh, uh, you know, great to hear that. Um, you know, from you, and I hope we can build on this observation. I think of the correlation between um, female leaders, at least in terms of heads of government, um, and, and and performance on COVID nineteen, and whether um, that's about women leaders or perhaps female. Um, qualities in leadership. Um, Cheryl, let's bring you in here. You've had such an interesting vantage point. Number one, uh, as someone who lives
lives just down the street from the U.S. Capitol. You've been on the front lines of, uh, of some pretty interesting events over the course of the last year, year and a half with regard to, to the U.S. government. Um, and then at the same time, of course, um, you know, you curate this network of frontline change makers around the world who have really been responding to this crisis. And it's not just about heads of government and other kinds of leaders in that traditional sense. What are some of your observations? Uh, I'm so honored to be here with you all. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for that question, Peter. So it's really a, a tale of two approaches. So again, I'm sitting in the seat of my country's um, government, uh, Washington, D.C. And, um, you know, the United States has demonstrated a number of missteps. Um, and there are writers like Peter Beinart and others um, who talk about uh, that both in our country, our domestic and foreign policy apparatus and infrastructure simply has not adjusted to take into account the magnitude of the many challenges that we face and that we've experienced over the past couple of years. And sort of the reflexive response to um, continue on with a relative continuation of past policies um, simply is not connected to the threats that we currently face. So I do believe that we are at a crossroads where policy, sort of path dependence policy, um, does not set us up for success as we move past the pandemic, um, recognizing that many more crises are to come. However, I would say that I um, live my professional life closer to the grassroots than at the rooftops. And there, I think we have a really different story. Um, such a triumph of what I call the care economy, social innovators and others that comprise the civil society who have been on the front lines of responding to what many management and leadership gurus um, call VUCA, right? Sort of the, the, the quadrant of volatility, uncertainty, uh, complexity, and ambiguity. And they're navigating uh, this terrain beautifully. Um, I think this comes back to um, what sort of leadership styles and approaches work in this moment. And I think the relationship-oriented frameworks that we're all familiar with, whether it's situational leadership, authentic leadership, servant leadership or transformational leadership, they all apply in this moment and they all apply because the, the common thread to each is um, the centrality of trust, right? And for those of us um, who come out of a public health background, we know full well um, that pandemic response as well as all the concomitant social and economic upheaval that results is a huge change management exercise, right? Um, and we also know there will be massive resistance to many of the policies and procedures that are required to be put in place in moments like this, um, because ultimately you're talking about a massive human behavioral change exercise. That's why trust is really critical in moments like these. So I think what we've seen certainly from many leaders on the front line and some political leaders, especially women leaders, is sort of the centering of trust and that includes compassion, that includes how to execute uh, and demonstrate um, efficacy um, are all really important in this moment, Peter. Thanks, Cheryl. And just to build on that for one second, if I may, um, we're, we're living at least in some parts of the world where there are certain deficits of trust and where, you know, social media echo chambers are dividing us and, uh, you know, a crisis like this can either bring us together or pull us further apart. So in the midst of a crisis where you don't have, you know, big stores of trust in society, what are some ways that we can actually go about building that? I think there are um, a number of ways that we can do that. First, um, taking action uh, in a meaningful way. And that includes certainly things relevant to a pandemic like good preparation, good planning. Um, there's also just sort of the role of information and good intelligence in this moment. And we all know we're living through a moment of disinformation as well, but recognizing um, the predicate of having good information to make make inform uh, decisions. I think the importance of adaptation in moments like uh, these, Peter, cannot be understated. And sort of the notion of collaboration and not just collaboration, I would go one stage deeper, sort of a sense of mutuality, um, right? That's sort of the ties that bind the power of social capital of which trust is a part. I think when you sort of roll up this up together and align it along with responsible leadership and accountable and accountable leadership, mm. I think that allows you um, to begin to make headway um, 
uh, against some of these challenges that we confront, whether they be public health challenges, economic challenges, um, political and social challenges. Thank you. And that, that notion of accountability really echoes something we heard from Moss Sirleaf um, yesterday in the opening plenary. And actually is a great segue to talking about a country near and dear to my heart, Rwanda. Um, so Dr. Agnes, uh, you know, we, we hear in the news every day about what's happening in Europe, what's happening in the U.S., et cetera, with regard to the pandemic. What a lot of us haven't heard about is that um, against pretty long odds, Rwanda has responded really beautifully to, um, to this crisis. Tell us a little bit about that and what you think is uh, is behind it. So what? thank you, Pete, and thank you for having me. It's so a, a big pleasure to be with all of you. Uh, the problem um, that we don't face in Rwanda is a leadership problem. And uh, I agree uh, with uh, what was said that we need a compassionate leadership, a leadership that takes decisions that is oriented to save and the, the maximum of uh, the people in a nation in an inclusive manner. And the problem with leadership today is that leader make, leaders make decisions that are not based on science. In Rwanda, we base all our decisions based on science. And I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about the government. I'm talking about the parliament. Um, and not like in some countries, based on personal gain, selfishness, and also only based on economy. It's a false calculation to believe we can sacrifice a portion of the population for economic gain or one self gain. And during the COVID pandemic, this has been observed both in low and mid income country and in high income countries. Countries where leaders were slow to act and implement evidence-based intervention that were known, everybody knew such wearing masks and hand washing, isolation, lockdown when needed, travel restriction if needed, they count far more deaths. And this shown us that leadership should be always driven by the health and well-being of all the people and not by economic gain or political agenda. Also, leaders are giving excuses that money is a problem. If we manage to do that in Rwanda, with less than $850 per capita. Imagine what other countries should have done. Many low-income countries have responded successfully to the pandemic compared to wealthier country. So money out of the list of problems. The remaining problems is really leadership not driven by uh, the good of the people. Another problem is the rise of nationalism. If you uh, if you have uh, foreigners in your in your country, treat them like people. Here it's a pandemic, and understand that people who are in refugee camp, people who are prisoners, need the same care. And if there is a vaccine, we have to go for the people at risk whatever origin they are, whatever things they have done. This is what I call um, civilization. Unfortunately, this is not a new phenomenon. And during global crisis, nationalism, starting by your nation and in the nation, your community, and in your community, your little group, it happened. And in the global vaccine rollout, we can see that Developing nations have, have been left behind and by the Western countries who prefer to vaccine people that are not at risk, where there was an, agre sorry, an agreement to vaccinate around the world people at risk and people in the front line. And this inequity in distribution is not also a new phenomenon. We have seen that with the distribution of HIV uh, treatment where the USA blocked at a certain point access to the medicine uh, to the developing world. So having a compassionate um, uh, leadership, but also take decision based on science and take decision of leaving no one out. So this is what we have done. 
Thank you, Dr. Agnes. And uh, for the audience, um, to, to uh, Agnes's right, that little tree seedling is a California redwood, um, just a year or two old, but with hopefully centuries to continue to grow at and around the University of Global Health Equity. That's the kind of long-term thinking we're trying to promote um, today and in the future. Joe, I haven't been to a party in almost a year and a half. And when we spoke on Friday, it was Friday evening for you, you kind of said, let's hurry this up. I've got a party to get to. Um, most of us aren't used to living like that anymore. Um, things have been a little bit more normal in Taiwan. Talk to us about um, maybe some aspects of, uh, of Taiwan's response, where it came from, why it was effective, um, and, and maybe what leadership lessons there are from Taiwan that we may all take away. Sure, sure. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm calling here from Taipei, Taiwan. It's about 9.30 uh, p.m. Uh, currently, uh, just a little uh, stats. Uh, uh, so far, Taiwan has about 1,067 confirmed cases and 11 deaths. And then right now, there's zero domestic cases. Um, so how have we achieved this? Um, I think if I would uh, wear a sort of a systems lens, I could think of this as a wonderful example of a system leadership. In a way, you know, when we bring various stakeholders together to have collective leadership, one key role is you need to have a, a sort of a system convener, someone who can bring multiple stakeholders together uh, to collaborate. And in Taiwan, the central for epidemic um, command center, which is the government agency, played that role. Uh, on day one, it, gave, it was given that authority to make decisions, to coordinate various collective action, to mobilize, mobilize resources the way it's needed. So that role was very clear at the beginning and, and people know who that person and that agency is. And then I think transparency is also very important for trust building. Uh, at the beginning, there were a lot of misinformation, a lot of panic. Uh, so very quickly, uh, we had established a system to dissem disseminate the information through da daily briefing, uh, through uh, travel and contact tracing. And the contact tracing we have is linked with the national health insurance system. So you, you have all those systems knowing very quickly where people has gone and and those information um, is very key for the public and for the government to get track of you know, where the, the diseases has been um, um, floating and, and disseminating. And then we also have an app, an app that you know, constantly, um, whenever there's misinformation to, this is the central place where we go to look for the real information. Um, so anytime there is some some doubts, you know, we can go there and have that sort of answer. And I want to talk a little bit also about uh, I thought beautifully the public-private partnership uh, using the mask as an example. At early day, early days, mask was in significant shortage right around the world, including Taiwan. Um, so very quickly, I think the government in coordination with the private sector start ramping up the production in 40 days going from 4 million to 50 million uh, masks per day production you know, increase increasing 90 to you know production line 14 days the private sector really feel like we are a national team like this is this is our collective challenge we must fight this fight together as a whole so that mobilization was coming really quickly, you know, business was, was, was dropping off their own uh, existing business order and just focusing on fighting this fight together. In, a, in terms of the allocation, I thought it's also a beautiful story of, you know, how we have the, at the beginning, the name rationing, uh, based rationing system, uh, at, and then we can get the mass through pharmacies and convenience stores Again, coordinating with the, you know the private sectors to distribute this, disseminate this as, as fast and as fairly uh, as possible. I also want to mention uh, the idea of a leadership by example and how the leaders were able to kind of listen to the public 
and be adaptive uh, in real time. Uh, there's one example I really love, which was uh, there's a story about the young boy in school and he wouldn't want to wear a pink mask because he thought that he might get laughed at at school. And so he refused to wear the mask uh, because he, you know, he got a pink mask. And then the next day, there's a line of public official, including the minister of health, they all wear a pink mask, demonstrating it's okay to wear a pink mask, even if, it, if you're male, it's fine, right? It's really, you know, quickly demonstrating that that's, it's fine, we, we can do this. And I will say, that, yeah, I guess the last is, you know, how the public all coming together in like this public collaboration. I feel like everybody feel we, this is our collective responsibility. Even right now, we don't have case. People still wearing masks on the street, uh, in, the, in the public train. Like this, this is the feeling of, this is not over yet. We all play a part and we cannot let it go and let loose. Only when we come together, we can fight this fight. Uh, successfully. So I, I, those are some of the examples I thought so uh, how, how Taiwan could come together and to, uh, to win this. Th thank you, Joe. And I think one of the, one of the things that I think has, uh, is it uh, draws a common thread between what we've seen in Taiwan, what we've seen in Rwanda is that in both places, um, responding to the pandemic was really made to be a whole of society effort with people coming together. And the, I think to an extent that came from the top down, um, but it also came from the, the, the bottom up as well. Um, so, so thank you for that. We're getting some great questions in that I'm going to bring in in a few moments. Um, I, I want to turn back to the, the Slido and to all of you in the audience again. So we've heard um, some of the characteristics and, and capabilities of systems leaders, um, compassion and um, empathy, the ability to walk in the shoes of others, um, uh, trust, uh, accountability, et cetera. We wanna hear from you. So if you can pull up that same Slido poll um, once again. Sorry, there's a little bit of a delay between the system that we're using and the hop-in system for the, for the poll to appear. So bear with us. So this is a word cloud exercise. Um, what traits should we be looking for in, in, in our leaders to respond to, um, to systemic crises, whether the, the pandemic or otherwise? So just type in a one word or couple word answer and you can enter as many as you like. And um, we'll, we'll let this run um, for, um, for a minute um, as, as answers come in. Um, As we do that, if, if I can, I think we'll leave this up on the screen. Um, Joe, there's a question um, that I wanted to come back to you on from, um, from Kathy Ray, um, something that you've taught me a lot about. How can system leaders both look inward to take care of their own people in a crisis and also look outward towards a greater welfare of people and planet? Uh, shall I respond right now? Yeah, go for it. The word cloud is going to is, is going to uh, manifest as you speak. But um, but I you know you spoke to our students about this last year, and uh, I'd love to hear your your thoughts on kind of the inner part of leadership. Yeah, I, I think um, it's really look inside and sensing into that collective humanness that we all have. In, in each one of us, uh, when we're facing a, a big crisis like this, how do we, uh, on one hand, look inside of, of that and then creating an enabling condition for us to, for that better side of our angel, the, 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 or somebody will call the Buddha nature, uh, to come out, right? Uh, as opposed to tapping to the, you know, the greed or the scarcity, uh, the, competi the, the competitive, uh, uh, for the sake of being competitive. Um, I, I think, you know, in, in, the, in the case of uh, this pandemic, uh, I think one thing though is when we are able to stand firm uh, on our own, we have the ability to take care of others. And so right at the beginning, the government focused a lot on, uh, for example, making sure that we internally have the mask 
that the, 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 the healthcare system is robust. Once our, our uh, food is outstanding, we started to export. At the beginning, we actually banned the export of the mask just to make sure that you know our system is in place and is robust. Uh, once we achieve that, we're starting to export and providing the help that we can. So there's part about you know taking care of yourself that you have the self love and, and compassion to oneself and they have the capacity to supporting others. Um, yeah, those are some of the, the lessons. Thank you so much, Joe. And as we as we look here at the the word cloud, um, uh, we're seeing some themes emerge really strongly here. So I think a lot of people agreeing with our speakers around the role of empathy compassion, collaboration, um, a really important word um, that hasn't come up yet, humility, um, absolutely. And, and certainly as someone who has been, um, uh, you know, part of this response from a public health perspective in an, air, in an area of um, rapidly emerging um, science, you know, we're surprised nearly every day and, uh, and being able to manage and handle uncertainty or those kind of VUCA conditions that Cheryl talked about is so important. Um, we see decisiveness, we see systems thinking, we see courage, trustworthiness, science, honesty, transparency. Um, uh, terrific. Um, I want to keep moving here. We have some other great questions um, that I want to weave in. Paul, let's come back to you. Um, you know, you've been someone that, um, you know, going back to the time when you were at Unilever, um, uh, you were also a huge champion in the development of the Sustainable Development Goals or the SDGs, and in putting together some of the mechanisms for collaboration um, to actually put the SDGs into action, um, both in the business community but also really across um, across sectors, right? And in some ways, the pandemic is a real test of that, our kind of structures or mechanisms for global governance and for cooperation. And I think they've really been, um, really been strained um, to an extent. Do you think that we need a new approach to global governance and cooperation to be able to address threats um, that transcend any single organization or country? Well, there's no doubt that um the sustainable development goals depend on actually goal number 17, which is partnership. The issues that we're facing of biodiversity or inequality or climate change or food security, the pandemics that we see now are of such magnitude that I believe nobody can solve this alone. And uh, the, the partnership was already referred to by the previous speakers and Joe just mentioned it, but they also require different solutions. Uh, what is currently happening is I think broadly that people know what needs to be done and there's a broader understanding of the issues that we have out there notably um, climate change and inequality but that collectively we're not able to move at the speed and scale that is needed and one of the reasons for that lack of speed and scale i think is is courage that we talked about uh, more people play uh, to play it safe to not lose versus to win and the other reason is indeed that we don't have the frameworks around us to support us to drive these bigger systems changes. Politics has become very short term. Many of the international institutions that were originally designed to deal with these global problems were designed in 1944 and don't reflect the reality of the current world anymore. And then we have become very self-centered. We saw that with the vaccines, the vaccine distribution, the lack of help or aid to the developing markets, and that list goes on. So if we want to get back to the sustainable development goals, which we have by all means the possibility to do and to achieve, um, unfortunately with COVID, we've been set back 20 to 30 years. But if we want to go back on track, it needs a collective effort at a level that is much higher than what we see right now. And it boils down to the true leadership skill that we talked about a little bit is to understand that by putting the interest of others ahead of your own, you're better off yourselves as well. We have a great opportunity in 2021 where we have the Food Summit, which Agnes Kalabata leads. We have the G7 and G20 led by responsible countries. We have the uh, Climate Summit. We have the COP15 in Kunming. We have the Nutrition Summit in uh, in uh, Japan. So we have an opportunity now where we can put our collective actions together to drive 
for the bigger systems changes that the world needs. Systems changes like decarbonizing the global economy, like making it more inclusive, uh, regenerative in the way we grow, and certainly ensuring that the conditions are there to make it a longer term and uh, a financial market that also uh, moves its financing in that direction. Initial indications are positive. We have now eight out of the 10 countries, biggest countries in the world, for example, setting net zero commitments on climate, which is very, very important. But these commitments are not yet matched with concrete actions that need to happen in the next 10 years. And this is where the 2021 events that I talked about have to absolutely focus on. And then obviously we have to restore some level of sanity and global cooperation and governance. And there's a little bit of a bright spot. The appointment of people like Ngozi to the WTO, the change of elections in the US, if I may be forthright, they've all provided a certain glimmer of hope in terms of making multilateralism function a little better for us at the time that we need it most. Thank you, Paul. And just briefly, this is a question coming in from um, from Jacques around leaders leading for the SDGs. Do you think it's uh, going to be more difficult than the, before the pandemic or, or less difficult to move forward on this agenda? Well, and indications, why? it's a little bit mixed, if I may say very quickly, but indications overall, I think, are swinging to the level of positive. We've really seen now, especially the private sector, which is a key player in moving these sustainable development goals forward. We've seen really a shift quite rapidly to more responsible business models, ESG, as I mentioned, and a different type of leadership. Um, is that enough? Uh, no. Is it fast enough? No. Are enough of them doing it? No. But you're seeing business step up. A great example right now is in the efforts that are happening in the US in 49 states to undermine the access to uh, the election uh, to uh, to voting rights for minority groups. You're seeing now a significant movement in the private sector where key CEOs and law firms and others step up and go together to try to not have the same tragedy that we saw in Georgia repeat itself in other states. But it requires still what some of the other panel members have talked about. It requires still a higher level of trust, a higher level of transparency and accountability that comes with that a better uh, understanding of the shared purposes that we're after, moving from the me to the we, from the ego to the eco, if you want to. And then we need to be sure that in all that we do, we keep the balanced power dynamics, which is to continuously remind ourselves that at the end of the day, it is about serving the ones that are left behind. That is the, the essence of the sustainable development goals, to not, not leave anybody behind. And if there is one lesson in COVID, is how badly the cards are stacked and that the people that always pay the price in society once more disproportionately pay the price. So we need to be sure that in all we do, that we keep it very people centric as Agnes so eloquently explained. Thank you, Paul. I wanna turn our discussion now to, to um, thinking about how we can cultivate, you know, this kind of leadership and uh, in all of everyone here today is involved in this in some way, shape or form, whether as, um, you know, whether as uh, educators, leaders, etc. And, and Cheryl, let's start with you. Um, there's a there's a question from Namrita. How do how do we create more of a sense of distributed leadership? Um, super interesting question. And maybe just to kind of build on that, you know, we think about where leaders come from or who decides, um, and we think about the structural barriers um, uh, to people having, uh, you know, voice to engage in and address, uh, you know, problems where they have lived experience. Um, this is something that Echoing Green has tackled really powerfully. Can you talk a little bit about that and perhaps how you approach um, identifying and cultivating talent? Yes, sure. And I think that's such an important um question, especially in this moment. And the work that Equine Green does is all about identifying um, early stage leadership and backing that leadership. Um, and so I think there is a democratic uh, and distributed aspect to doing that. Um, fundamentally, it is about um, sort of putting aside notions around um, risk, who is a risk and who is not, who has value, who does not. Um, 
really interrogating and grappling with biases, both implicit and explicit. And fundamentally, it really is a question and an exercise around power, right? Who has it? Um, who does it? How do you seed it? And how do you share it? Um, and I think um, the work of the world in this moment is uh, about distributing opportunity for agency and uh, efficacy across communities. Um, you know, we are at a moment, we talk so much, Peter, about this notion of systems change, but it's forged in a moment where we're seeing ever growing levels of both systems capture and systems failure. You know, those of us that are sitting here in the United States, as Paul so eloquently discussed, have watched a pandemic sort of rip through black and brown communities. Um, and we have been so disproportionately impacted. And this stands alongside sort of the trauma that communities of color are facing in this moment of racial uh, reckoning. Um, we're trying to navigate you know, the trial of the killing of Mr. Floyd at the very same moment, not 10 miles away from a 20 year old young man, Dante Wright was killed at the hands of police less than a week ago. Um, these are devastating structural inequities um, that are really indications of how systems simply cannot be changed. That language is too incremental. It is too frail of an approach. We're talking about large scale capture and failure of these systems that work for too few of us. So the work becomes, how do we push back against that? And in many ways, this is an exercise of um, shifting power. Um, I think you do that by um, distributing opportunities to identify and invest in next generation leadership, giving voice to more people, people who look different than you do, people who come from different circumstances than you do, and then ensuring that they have the concomitant resources to really drive uh, their approach to change in their communities. Um, I'm often reminded of the work of um, the evolutionary biologist Elizabeth Satoris, who sort of seminal work on how caterpillars become butterflies. And it's really sort of this um, crescendo of um, um, imaginal disks, which sort of overtake the caterpillar system. Um, and at first, the uh, caterpillar's uh, immune system can push back against these intruders, these outliers. But over time, as they accelerate and escalate in numbers, they overwhelm the current system. But out of that, out of that battle comes something new and beautiful, um, sort of a new approach um, to the way that we um, build society. And this is sort of the rebuilding and reimagining work that we have to do. So Echo and Green has really thought hard in the last year in particular about how do we go out and find and provide resources to next gen talent. For us in particular, we've been spending a disproportionate amount of our time on historically black college and university campuses, working with extraordinary, dazzling young talent um, that believes it needs to be on the front line of driving change in its communities. So I think it begins with sort of showing up, standing in solidarity, seeding power, providing resources um, to those who um, look like the multiracial, multicultural society we all need to build in this moment. Thanks, Cheryl. And yes, let's build on that a little bit. So um, at University of Global Health Equity, you work with lots of young um, healthcare professionals and, and others who want to work for, for health equity, coming from mostly non-elite backgrounds, to sort of say the least. And, um, and we sit in the classroom and talk about confronting big power structures um, that seem big and immutable and all-powerful and, um, and, and, and resistant to change. How do you go about cultivating uh, a sense of um, a sense of possibility um, for um, for people to actually drive that kind of change? So, you know, uh, Peter, uh, no one is born leader per se. There are some who, are, who have more qualities than others, but all the qualities, and they are in the the crowd words that uh, uh, were on our screen uh, recently. They, those qualities can be learned, and the best way to teach is to show what happened if you um, express that, and what happened if you don't. Second, so we teach them that each and everyone is a leader. The community health worker in his village is a leader. If he behaves wrongly, the village is not going well for the health part of it. 
same at district, same at national level. And we show them that the first thing you have to do is to cultivate humility. And humility was named there, and I love it. Humility, but also compassion and be centered and focused to the most vulnerable. Because if you do the best for the most vulnerable, everybody will benefit. We teach them also that don't afraid to be courageous. People, um, the myth of being absolutely at risk if you are courageous, you are more at risk if you are black and poor and not a leader in the US, for example, in UK as well. So, but if you are educated and you can stand and express, use what you can do for the vulnerable, not for yourself. It will come anyway for you because you are among the privileged who are already educated. So experience is uh, great also. We show them outside the world now with COVID is difficult and we have to use other way and other contact. We show them, we show and make them experience that life. So we create the desire to be continuously learn about that because nobody was expecting COVID and what it brought and highlight. COVID brought nothing new. At global level, COVID has shown and highlight the inequities that were there before, but also highlight what it takes to be inclusive, to be focused on the vulnerable, to be led by science and evidence, to certainly learn about the history of humanity, what went wrong since the year 1994, 40, uh, 1914, sorry, uh, because yeah, it was a wrong time for us. Me, I was um, not born, but my parents were colonized with no right in their own land. So show that progress are possible, show that you need to stand for this, show that you will only make it if you manage to cultivate trust, solidarity, and be an exemplify all the qualities that are needed. So uh, this is what we do, and especially teach them the willingness to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Agnes, wise words. Um, a question that could be for anybody, and then we'll close with a question for everybody. Um, this question comes from uh, Nicola Reindorf at Crisis Action. Um, would the panel agree that the COVID pandemic is revealing we need leaders to have a different relationship to doubt and uncertainty? Um, the truly great leaders are not those that are paragons of all-knowing certainty, but are those that are curious, incisive, humble, and know how to handle doubt as a source of insight, not a weakness to be hidden. Um, kind of a leading question, I think a really good one. Anyone want to comment on that? <laughs> Everybody could. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Well, I'll just give a, how about I give a resource to um, everyone? Um, I was recently reviewing um, Cynthia Rayner and Francois uh, Bonici's forthcoming book, The Systems Work of Systems Change. It's a terrific text. Um, but one of the qualities that they talk about um, is sort of um, the requirement that systems organizations and systems leaders um, have a learning centered approach that is nimble and innovative. And I think that is exactly what the, um, uh, audience member is talking about um, this learning orientation that is so tied up with curiosity and recognizing that um, there's so much you don't know, but being open um, to absorbing new information, iterating, um, I think is a really powerful and central force around systems change. I second that. Um, uh, I think also just been reviewing this book, which uh, will, I think, be published in a couple of months' time. Um, I think this notion of driving change in complex system that is going to be, you know, not a linear process that's going to be subject to unintended consequences, failures, um, you know, cultivating a learning mindset is critically important. Um, anyone else like to comment on this? 
Yeah. Um, Joe and then yes. Uh, sure. Um, certainly, I think you know this this pandemic really bring out the humility in us as humans. Um, you know, we we think that we are a human as a human species think it's almighty and can can do anything but it really you know brought down to our knees and i think it's a good thing because um i, I have to think that what is system leadership it's not about being that all-powerful leader who ha has the answer but it's about creating the space for us to be human again right to be to be able to show our vulnerability to be able to show that i don't know but I still will work towards that, you know, to, to show that uh, we don't have all the answer, but if we work together, we can have that uh, uh, collective action as a solution through our collaboration. It's really creating a space for us just to be human. And when we are at that human level, we connect at that level, and then we, we come to that collective aspiration. So what is it that we want to create together for us, for our generation, next generations, and, and so forth. And so I think this is a wonderful opportunity for to, to you know, it, it, it's it's the one thing that we're all facing right now, you know, no matter what, which country you are, what status, how much wealth you have, we're all facing the same thing. So it's a tremendous opportunity. And I think it really cultivates, you know, how we can be that human and create space for us to be human again. Hmm. Thank you, Joe. And yes, briefly. Yes, I just want to say that first of all, uh, the 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 people, the leaders, need to understand that we all face the same thing. Yes, but we the result is not the outcome is not the same everywhere. Just because they worked on the system, and if they want to work, it's it's it. They don't want to work on improving systems that are more inclusive. And if they want that, they have to be ready to learn. To to learn, they have to be ready to, with humility, to fail because we face something that nobody uh, faced before. System approach. You cannot be a leader if you don't have an approach that is a systemic approach. Thank you. Um, last question for everybody in our final three or four minutes here. So we'll have to keep this brief. Um, this is coming from Celia. Um, how do you personally remain hopeful in light of the events of this past year, which can evoke a sense of despondency and hopelessness? Um, how would you encourage young leaders to, to remain hopeful? Um, maybe we'll finish in the order we started, if that's okay. Paul, then Cheryl, then yes, then Joe. Well, I always like to quote uh, Desmond Tutu, who said on the panel, are you optimistic or pessimistic? He said, I'm a prisoner of hope. I think we've all discovered that if our minds go on the negative side and we become cynics or skeptics, it doesn't uh, lead to anything. And frankly, we make our own lives more miserable. So I always like to keep a certain sense of realism, but also a certain sense of positivism, positivism and hope. And it comes from three things. The first one is innovation is going fast and has given us a lot of possibilities that are now within our means at a faster pace than we've thought before. The second thing is that we unfortunately have waited so long to address some of these fundamental issues that the cost of action is actually now lower than the cost of inaction. And I think COVID is a clear example of that. So if you don't have the moral compass as much as certainly our panel members have, then certainly the economic forces are starting to now quite rapidly work into your advantage. And then the third reason is what already was mentioned by the panelists before, which is the young generation. They are 50% of the world right now below 30. They're going to be 100% tomorrow. They're more creative, more innovative, more purpose-driven. And I'd certainly want them to have a seat at the table. I hope actually very soon that we can actually give them the table. Thank you, Paul. Cheryl? Yeah, I agree with everything that Paul said. Look, you know, um, I think I feel very fortunate and privileged that I spent my professional life, life working with next generation leaders, many young people um, who bring such a sense of 
um, agency, um, wish for self-determination, and quite frankly, fierce love uh, for their communities. And they um, are stepping up as opposed to bowing down um, during this tumultuous moment. You know, I was smack in the center of um, the racial uprisings here in this country that, um, you know, propagated across the world. It was the largest um, multi-generational, cross-racial, cross-class, um, outcry for racial justice um, that we've seen in this country. And it was extraordinarily hopeful. And it spilled over into the past election season um, that was really um, a powerful um, cudgel against real democratic backsliding in our country in particular. Um, so I'm very hopeful that people rise. They always rise and they are perpetually unbowed. Um, so I'm hopeful that more of that will come and we're entering a period, as Paul said, when innovation I think will only accelerate and escalate as we reimagine a new way forward. Thank you, Cheryl. And yes. So me, I'm absolutely optimistic. See, still, I'm full of anger and rage, but so optimistic. You know why? Because what we worked on during years uh learning how to create resilient system with little money and show and seeing what we have achieved in rwanda face facing this pandemic prove us right and prove that we can teach it and that's what we are doing peter since five years we are uh, uh, growing leaders to create and repair health sector to make them resilient and at the service of whole in an inclusive manner with solidarity and humility. So I'm very privileged to live where I'm living. I'm very privileged to do what I'm doing and I'm full of optimism and I'm so graced by life. Thank you. Thank you, and yes, and Joe. Uh, yeah, I, I think, um, I, I guess I will quote um, a quote by uh, I think it's uh, Ed Cartol, uh, something like uh, acknowledging the good th that you already have in your life is the foundation for all abundance. So it's really, yes, we are facing this great challenge, but there's so much good in our life that we already have. So instead of worrying about the past or about the future, you know, cultivating our capacity to be staying present and just appreciating what we already have. It's already there. And with that, you have a sense of abundance, you have a sense of peace and calm. And with that, it gives you life energy to move forward. So not letting that go and you know, worrying about the past or the future, but staying relaxed in present. I think that's a cultivation that we can all have when I'm stressed, I try to remind myself of that and, and, and then you know, stating in that uh, present state. So I'm hopeful because we all have that capacity as humans. Thank you, Joan. We've gone three minutes over. I think it was worth it. Um, I hope you agree. Um, what gives me hope is um, solidarity, you know, being able to make common cause with others fighting for the same things um, and to, um, to lift one another up when times are hard. And, um, and I feel a great sense of solidarity at this moment with, um, with the four of you and with all of you out there today. And this is the thing I love about the Skull World Forum, um, that it's a um, it's a real community of people uh, coming together and lifting each other up. So um, I think lots of reason for um, hope today, despite the challenges. Um, we're gonna, we're, we're at the end of our session here. For anyone who wants to stick around, we're gonna move informally into the Skull Center's community hub. Um, so if you go into the community hub on the left-hand side of hop in, um, and then scroll down till you see the Orange Skull Center for social entrepreneurship logo. I'll be there. Um, some of our speakers are, are going to come and try to hang out for a few minutes and, and we'll just continue the conversation a little bit less formally. Um, we'll put a link to that in the chat as well. So please do join us if you can. Um, and otherwise, please put your hands together around the world for Paul, Cheryl, Agnes, and Joe. Thank you all for being with us today.